November 1, 2025, Hi, I'm Mike Thompson, and welcome to 121 Point Mike. This is Ground School. In this video, I'm going to show you around VFR maps. Pilots typically will want to go somewhere. Even if you just like flying around, you're going to be required to do cross-country trips to get your pilot's license, and so you're going to need maps. There are VFR maps, and there are IFR maps. This video will only cover the VFR maps, and so if you're just beginning to fly, then this is the video for you. Visual Flight Rules, VFR, is what you're going to have to operate under. If you're studying for an instrument rating, then check out my video on IFR maps, but for flying under instrument flight rules, obviously. The first time you see a VFR map, it's very confusing. So I'm going to go over the symbols that you'll see on a map and explain what each of them mean so that you'll know what you need to know for your FAA test. VFR maps are the colorful ones in shades of green to brown. The color is related to the elevation of the ground in that area, as measured from mean sea level, or MSL. Green elevations are low, and brown elevations are high. These maps show you features on the ground that you can use to navigate with. They also depict the navigational aids that you can use to get where you'd like to go. The maps also have symbols for airports, airspaces, airways, obstructions, and communications. The ground features are depicted in sufficient detail that you'll actually be able to identify them and orient yourself. Airports are probably the first thing that you want to know about, right? Since that's where your flights will begin and hopefully end. There are two types of airports, those with a control tower and those without. It might surprise you that uncontrolled airports far outnumber the controlled ones. Controlled airports are the busy ones that have lots of activity. Smaller airports don't need control because there isn't enough traffic to justify it, and pilots watch out for themselves and for each other. So how do you know, though, which type of airport is which on a map? By its color. Blue airports are controlled and magenta ones aren't. Most airports are little magenta circles with a line or two inside of them that depict the runway direction and length. Controlled airports with shorter runways are depicted in blue. The fact that there's a little circle that's filled with color means that the runway is paved, and the circle indicates that the longest runway is less than 8,070 feet. The biggest airports are depicted without the circles and just the runway layouts. Airports with these longer runways are also typically blue. Busier airports, bigger planes, and so they need controlling. There are a few uh, long magenta ones out there though, so see if you can find them. You'll also see open circles, and they're typically magenta, and it just means the runway isn't paved. The runway direction and relative lengths aren't shown either. These are public use airports, uh, but you can also see that these ones are listed as hazardous. Uh, but here's the identifier, this number here is the field elevation in MSL, and here's the length in hundreds of feet. And this is the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, or CTAF. It's indicated by this little C. You'll make your position reports and talk to other pilots on this frequency. A lot of open circles have an R inside them. These are private use airports that you need permission from the owner to use. But of course you can always land anywhere in an emergency. You just might have some splaining to do. Sometimes you'll see an X over a circle. This is an abandoned airport, and it's not suitable for use, but it's good enough for navigation, like here, southwest of 00 Foxtrot. You can also see a note here that says the area around this airport, uh, up to 1500 AGL, isn't within the Powder River MOA. And it uses a right-hand pattern for runway 10. Sometimes you'll see a star next to the airport symbol, and this means that it has a rotating beacon, like Kilo 68. Single grain and single white for a civil airport. Don't try to land your plane if you see anything else. It is uh, these little tick marks around it. That means that it's got fuel available on the field. Tick marks are really only shown, though, on the small circular symbols because if the airport has the larger runways, then fuel is assumed, right? It couldn't be very good as a commercial airport if you didn't have fuel. Here at Garnett, we can see that it has AWOS2 weather available on 122.8 which is also the CTAF frequency, as shown by this little field, uh, as shown by this little C. Uh, field elevation here is 989, and it's got a 2,600 foot runway, running approximately north-south. If you see an anchor, guess what that means? 
it's a seaport, like here in Honolulu. Field elevation is zero, which makes sense, right? Uh, and the water is 5,000 feet long. Although, if they let you taxi south of this runway and take off to the south, I suppose your available runway would be several thousand miles long. And that should be plenty. Since we're here, uh, we can also see here that there are two tower frequencies, and that we can get the weather from the ATIS on 127.9. The longest paved runway is 13 feet above sea level, and it is 12,300 feet long. You can always email me with any questions, or you can connect with me on PalTap. Uh, it's this cool new video chat service that gets you answers much quicker than a lengthy email or comment chain could. The link to my PalTap profile is also in the description, with other aviation resources. Let's look at a couple airports uh, so that you can see what else they tell you. Here at Palm Beach International, KPBI, we can see the control tower frequency is 119.1. We can get weather on the ATIS, which is the Automated Terminal Information Service, at 123.75. It's only 20 feet above sea level. This L means that the airport is lit from sunset to sunrise. The longest runway is 10,000 feet long. And Unicom, which is if you need to talk to somebody on the ground about maybe weather briefings or fuel or whatever, uh, it's usually a private business. Uh, that frequency is 122.9 or 5. And there's a little AOE down here at the bottom, which means this is an airport of entry, which just means this has customs and immigration services available on site. If we go a little north of Palm Beach here to Stewart, we can see that it is a smaller airport. It's got three runways. The identifier is uh, SUA, Sierra Uniform Alpha. The control tower frequency is 126.6. It's only operating part-time here as evidenced by this star. So you'll need to check the chart legend over on the side to see what the control tower hours are. When the tower is not operational, 126.6 is the CTAF frequency that you'll use to make your position reports and you know talk to the other planes in the air, as evidenced by this little filled in C here. Weather is available on 134.475. It's only 16 feet above sea level. The little star here next to the lighting symbol means that there are limitations on the lighting, so you'll need to check the chart legend over on the side. And the longest runway is 5,800 feet. You can see that there's a rotating beacon and that there's fuel available on the field as evidenced by these tick marks. And here at Dillon County, KDLC, we can see that uh, this is a uncontrolled airport as evidenced by this little magenta circle. It's got a fairly short runway here, kind of oriented to the, uh, from the southwest to the northeast. You can see here that it is 133 feet elevation. It is lit, sunset to sunrise. The runway is 3,000 feet long. And the CTAF, the frequency that you're going to talk to the other pilots on, is a 122.9. The airport has a beacon from sunset to sunrise, as evidenced by this little star. But you notice there's no tick marks, so there is no fuel available on this field. You're going to have to go somewhere else nearby to get it. Okay, that just about does it for airports. There's always the legend over on the side panel that explains what all the symbols mean. You're going to need to know all these chart symbols for your test. So spend a lot of time looking at them and then planning your fantasy flights. Let's talk about airspace on the chart, shall we? because many of these airports we just looked at are surrounded by a colored little area. Those colors mean something, and you're sure to show up on your test. There's a separate video on airspace for additional details and rules and regulations within each one. This video is just focusing on the charts. First of all, there are two types of airspace, just like there are two types of airports. There's uncontrolled, class golf, G airspace, and there's controlled airspace, a, B, C, D, E. There's no F. Nobody likes an F. Just remember that G is for ground. It's the airspace closest to the ground, and there's no air traffic control there. For the most part, Class G goes from the surface up to 1200 AGL, and that's where the Class E starts. Classes G and E are not shown on the charts. You just have to know that they're there. I bet you noticed that all those faded little magenta circles around all those little magenta airports, didn't you? Here at Ottawa, this means that the Class E airspace begins at 700 above ground level instead of 1200. The Class E airspace that usually picks up at 1200, where the Class G left off, dips down a bit lower here at these airports. 
This is for people on IFR flight plans, really, but it matters to you VFR guys because the uh, visibility and cloud requ clearance requirements are different there, and you're going to need to know them for a test. I'm not going to discuss all the rules here, though, because that video, this video is just about charts, and there's a separate video for the rules. The faded magenta circles might have protrusions on them like this. Here at Joplin, uh, this is to make sure that the airspace covers the runway approaches. Let's move on to class D. This airspace surrounds the airport with a control tower, but no approach control radar. Here at Joplin class D, it's shown by this little dash blue line around the blue airport. It extends out about four miles from the airport, and it goes from the ground to about 2500 AGL. There's usually a class E magenta a little bit further out like this. Remember that class D has a control tower and a teeny tiny airspace, but no local approach control radar. There's then there's the next level of controlled airspace, and that's Charlie, and they have radar. Here over at Springfield across the way, it's shown by this thick solid magenta circle. Typically, there are two concentric circles, and these represent the upside down wedding cake shape of the airspace. Class C airspace uh, surrounds airports that are a little bit larger than Class D, and they're the ones with the moderate levels of passenger flights or military bases. The center circle extends from the surface up to about 4,000 AGL. The outer circle's vertical limits are shown as well, um, and so let's take a look at some Class C airspaces. Class C will have little white boxes with magenta borders about 20 miles out that says which frequency to call them on. And you need two-way radio communications before you can cross that magenta line and enter their airspace. Looking at Palm Beach again, you can see here that its airspace is a little bit funnier than the airspace over at Springfield. Here the surface area you can see goes from the surface up to 4,000 feet. Now AGL and MSL in this case are the same because this airport is basically at sea level. You can see here though that the outer shelf has this little area down for LNA carved out so that people operating out of that airport um, can operate without being inside class C airspace because this is an uncontrolled airport. And you can also see that the surface area has a little bit carved out. It looks to be about maybe two miles, uh, a two mile radius was carved out for the uh, Palm Beach County Park Airport. You can see out here over the ocean, depending on which direction you're coming from, you're gonna call approach on different frequencies. If you're coming from the north or the east up here, you're gonna call them on 128.3. If you're coming down here from the southeast, you're gonna call them on 125.2. And here in the Oklahoma City area, you can see that there are two Class Charlie airspaces butted up against each other because the other one belongs to Tinker Air Force Base. If you're approaching this area, you can see that you'll call them on different frequencies depending on where you're coming from. If you're coming from the northeast, you'll call them on 124.2. Out west, you'll call them on 124.6. And if you're coming from the south or southeast, you'll call them on 120.45. You'll see here that the uh, surface areas of both of these airspaces have been carved out. One for this little abandoned downtown airport that used to be there. And then the uh, surface area was carved out of there and of Tinker Air Force bases for this little flyway uh, north-south through the city. There's also uh, a little carving for the uh, upper shelf down around the Norman area for their airport. And then also for that abandoned airport over here by the freeway up in the uh, northern part. You can see that the surface areas go up to 5,300 feet MSL, which is about 4,000 AGL around here. And you can see that the uh, shelf areas extend from 2,500 feet up to 5,300 feet on both the uh, Oklahoma City and the Tinker shelves. Lastly, there's the class Bravo airspace. B is for big. These are your major airports, and of course they have radar too. B airspace is shown by thick, solid blue lines, and it's got more concentric circles than Class C. The core goes from the surface up to about 10,000 feet above the ground, and of course all altitudes you see on the charts are given in MSL so that you don't have to worry about doing the math and calculating the ground uh, height. You'll need to explicit clearance though to enter Class B, something like November 121 Mike cleared Class Bravo. Then you may enter. Of course, call them ahead of time. 
Maybe you cross this magenta line 30 miles out and uh, it says mode C required. Mode C is the transponder code that gives them your altitude over in ATC. The controllers uh, need to know how high you are so that they can pack the traffic in a little bit better. Class Bravo airspace can get very complicated. Uh, so we better have a look at some of the Bravo airspace. Here at Kansas City, where we just were for our example, you can see that the surface does go from the surface uh, to 8,000 feet MSL. But the core area here has a couple little areas carved out for the neighboring areas. Down here in the southeast, you've got this, these couple shelves are carved out here for uh, Kansas City downtown. But overall, this airspace is fairly easy to understand. Each of the shelves has their uh, altitudes marked in several places. And uh, yeah, let's go to uh, Dallas, down south here a ways. I'm sure pretty much everybody that's ever flown an airplane has been to Dallas. This one's extremely complicated. It's got shelves all over the place. You can see here that the uh, surface on this one goes up to 11,000 feet. And then it's got all these concentric circles with their wedges cut out. There's a little bit here. Uh, you can see his section starts at 2,000, goes to 11. The altitudes are marked everywhere. You just sometimes have to kind of go hunting for them. Like this one here, this little L-shaped segment starts at 2,000. They couldn't fit the altitude in there. Um, you've got these big arms that come out here to catch the approaches here for 3-1 um, right. Same thing here for uh, runways 1-3. The uh, t northernmost portion actually doesn't extend all the way to the top. It only goes to 10,000. If you look out here in the west, you can see it starts at 6,000. Um, what else we got here? Down in the south also, it starts at 4,000 and only goes to 10,000. So the, the top ends of these things are chopped off. But you can see here that it steps up so that it can make room for all these neighboring airports. So that you can, say, fly into Addison, which is Class D, and not have to get Class Bravo clearance. Uh, as long as you stay below 2,500 feet here, you can see. And you can see here this little minus, this 3-0 three, three minus, is for Addison's airspace because it's got the dashed uh, lines around it. And that means it goes up to 2,999 feet. Does not include 3,000. That's what the little minus means. So here then, if you go over to LAX, you can see their airspace is uh, not really round at all because it's surrounded by a bunch of other stuff and they just, you know, made the, whatever shape they felt like. Same thing though, uh, if you can figure out, you know, what each sector means. Here's your surface area, and it, you know, extends back this way a ways until you get to this blue line here. Then it steps up to 2,000 feet. Looks like everywhere you're going up to 10,000 feet. Uh, you've got a little corridor right through here where the runways are, and then you've got these sectors here. Here's some Class Delta airspace up to 2,500. Here's some Class Delta up to 2,700 for this airport. This 2,500 here is for this airspace here. This 2400 is for this airport here. You can see it's just a bunch of a bunch of airspace right on top of each other. Now you'll see in manuals everywhere the pictures of the upside down wedding cakes that depict how this airspace widens as you get higher. But this is somewhat misleading. So I wanted a visual aid to help you visualize airspace a bit better. So I picked some airspaces and then uh, created some SOLIDWORKS models and then 3D printed the airspace in a one inch equals 12 mile scale. Uh, it's a very sad wedding cake indeed. They look more like pancakes than wedding cakes. They're simply drawn at, as wedding cakes uh, to better illustrate you know, that they're shapes. They are much, much wider than they are tall. And uh, when they're made to this scale, where one inch is 12 nautical miles, the different shelves are very hard to depict. That's why I did them in different colors. But now you can see um, what airspaces and stuff, you know, really look like. I kind of wish I'd had an upside down wedding cake as a groom's cake. That would have been kind of a neat way to show my love for aviation. Um, of course, I don't plan to get married a second time, so I guess that's out. Really, all you'd need is just a central stick and then, you know, tiers to hold the shelves and things. Uh, so that might be kind of a cool thing to make someday for some reason. But anyway, well, have you had enough? Uh, if so, that's okay. But if you're really into maps like I am, then you can read the FAA's aeronautical information and chart guides. Uh, they just have everything in there. And the link's in the description, of course. 
The charts have legends also that explain what the symbols mean if you're ever in doubt. They also contain the information for the special airspaces, so look on the side panels for the additional info that you're going to need to complete your flight safely. We've covered an awful lot of stuff. VFR charts are really fun to look at and they make for great decor. My hope is that you feel confident after watching this video that you feel like this is the most thorough VFR chart guide out there. I know it's a lot of info to digest in one sitting, so you can definitely uh, click on the particular chapter if you want to review it, but definitely play around with your charts and um, you can check the FAA's master guide you know, if you want more reference info. Lastly, just like I said, play around, um, planning your dream flights and things, and this is going to get you much more familiar with the charts. You can always email me with any questions, or you can connect with me on PalTap for a quick video chat. Sometimes the video chat, you know, is the best way to get an answer to your problem because it's a lot quicker than a back and forth email or comment chain. I want to make sure that you have the knowledge and are able to apply it on the ground and in the skies. Knowledge isn't power unless you can apply it. So stay with me on 121 Point Mike.